Good morning, afternoon, evening, night. Welcome back to the Mr. Sin channel. Today we start unit five with our first topic review video, an introduction to memory. Let's start this video with a simple experiment. For this experiment, you'll need a stopwatch, a timer, and something to write down your time. What I want you to do is pause this video and count from one to 26. Make sure you time yourself and write down how long it took you to complete this task. Once you're done, unpause the video. All right, did you finish? Now for round two, what I want you to do is time yourself again, but this time recite the alphabet from A to Z. Once again, time yourself and record the time when you're done. Once you're completed with the task, unpause the video. Excellent job. Now for this last round, what we're gonna do is switch between the two tasks. What I want you to do is say a number and then the alphabet. So for example, you'll say 1A, 2B, 3C, and so on. Once you completed this task and timed yourself, of course, write down that time and then unpause the video. I promise this will all make sense soon. See, that wasn't so bad. Now what I want you to do is look at the different rounds and compare your times. What do you notice? I would bet that most of you were a lot faster at completing the first round and the second round, and that most of you took a while to finish the third round. For many of you, I bet actually that you probably took more time on the third round than both the first and the second round put together. This illustrates a concept known as task switching. When we are doing one task, we are more efficient and faster at it. When we're doing multiple tasks at a time, we slow down and are more likely to make errors and takes it longer to complete the task. Definitely something to think about as we learn about memory. When you are studying, are you also watching Netflix, TikTok, or working on some other tasks? If so, you're decreasing your ability to efficiently study, which increases the amount of time you need to study. Unfortunately, we're just not good at multitasking. Before we keep going, let's quickly talk about what memory actually is. Memory is information that persists over time. It's information that was acquired through different experiences and can be stored and retrieved. Every day, you experience thousands of different sensations. We interact with different people, places, and objects. We smell different smells and touch different surfaces. All of this forms new memory. When we're talking about knowledge, facts, or general information, we're talking about semantic memory. And when we're talking about experiences or events, we're talking about episodic memory. These two different types of memory make up our conscious memory system. We are constantly taking in new information, but in order to see if we learned anything from all of these different sensations, we need to look at these different retention measures. The first is, can you recall the information? This is when information that was learned from a past experience can be brought back into our conscious mind. For example, when you were taking a test and you're trying to recall the information for a fill in the blank question. The second is, can you recognize the information? This is when information is shown to you and you are able to identify the information that you previously learned. For example, again, when you're taking a test at school and you're trying to figure out which multiple choice option is the correct option. When trying to remember the differences between recall and recognition. Remember that with recall, you're coming up with the information without any prompts. Recognition, on the other hand, is when you see the information and you're identifying the correct answer. The third is, can you quickly relearn the information? Traditionally, if you've learned information before, when you go back to review it or study it, you'll have an easier time relearning it. For example, if you paid attention throughout the class and throughout the entire semester, then you shouldn't have to spend that much time studying for your final. Most of your studying will probably be a refresher and relearning the smaller details instead of trying to learn everything for the first time. We can thank Herbin Ebbinghaus for this understanding of how memory and relearning works. Ebbinghaus conducted an experiment where he took random syllables and spent time trying to learn them and memorize them. He would read them aloud and try to recall them later. What he found was as he continued to practice the list, the amount of time it took him to relearn the list went down. Even though on the second day, Ebbinghaus could only remember a few of the syllables, he found it required significantly less time to relearn the list. Now, when talking Talking about memory, we have to have an understanding of the information processing model. This model is an example of serial processing. What this means is that information forms in a specific order, and only one process occurs at a given time. This model looks at our memory as essentially a computer. We take information in and our brain encodes the information. From there, the information is processed and stored. This is when information gets retained. Then at a later date, when we need to access the information, our brain will retrieve the information by a process called retrieval. 
Unlike a computer though, our brain does not store information in one order. Oftentimes it uses parallel processing. This is when the brain processes a variety of different things simultaneously. This is the brain's normal mode of information processing when dealing with multiple bits of information. One example of this is when you're at a theme park with your friend, you remember the smell in the air, the temperature outside, and the other information you did not consciously process. You have explicit memories and also implicit memories. Two concepts we'll talk more about in our next video. Now, Richard Atkinson and Richard Schifferin proposed a three-stage model to better explain how our memories are formed. First, we have sensory memory. This is immediate. You are receiving the information and you have a very short recording of the information. Here we can see there is iconic memory and echoic memory. Iconic memory is visual stimuli. This memory only lasts for less than a second. Echoic memory, on the other hand, is auditory stimuli. And this memory can last anywhere between one to four seconds. Next, we have our short-term memory, also known as our working memory. This is where we can hold a couple bits of information for a short period of time before the information is forgotten or stored. For example, if you've ever tried to remember an order number or a phone number, you're using your short-term and working memory. This memory only lasts for about 20 to 30 seconds, and this time can be extended if we use maintenance rehearsal, which is when you continuously go over the information. If we go back to our example about the telephone number, we could try to remember the number by using maintenance rehearsal. We could continue to repeat the number over and over in our mind as we type it into our phone. However, this is not the most effective way of learning, and most likely once we stop repeating the number, we'll probably forget it. Now, I mentioned that the second stage was short-term memory, also known as working memory. Working memory is a more updated view on short-term memory. It views short-term memory not just as a place to hold information, but an active part of the encoding process. George Miller proposed that people can store about one to seven pieces of information in our short-term memory. However, this is only probably true if we're not being distracted by anything else and are focusing on that information alone. After our working or short-term memory, we encode the information and we move it into our long-term memory. This is where knowledge, skills, and all of our experiences are stored. When information is needed, we retrieve the information from our long-term memory. One important aspect of this model is our attention. If we're not focusing on the information, we can see that it will not be encoded into our long-term memory. This model is focused around our explicit memories, which are memories that we consciously make. We have to use our effort to remember this information, a process known as effortful processing, which is encoding that requires attention and conscious effort. Now, whenever we are learning explicit memories, we are also at the same time learning implicit memories. This is information or skills that we learn without our awareness. These memories are acquired through through the automatic processing. This is unconscious encoding, which helps us remember time, space, frequency, motor, and cognitive skills. When we are learning, we are unconsciously remembering different details about information, like images around the information that we learned, or how many times certain events happen, or the order of information we take in. Implicit memories also include procedural memory for certain automatic skills, such as how to rollerblade or ride a bike. We can also see classically conditioned associations here as well such as being afraid of the dentist, because when you were younger, they had to pull a bunch of teeth, and now you associate pain with the dentist, even when you're an adult. Great. Now, whenever we are trying to encode information, we utilize shallow processing and deep processing. Shallow processing is when we are encoding information on the basic level. The focus is on the appearance of the words or the basic structure of the information. There's little attention focused on meaning, and this often occurs during maintenance rehearsal. While deep processing, on the other hand, is when we encode information based on the meaning of the information. This tends to be better for retention of information. Here, you're paying attention to the meaning of the information and trying to connect it with other information in your memory. This often occurs during elaborative rehearsal. Elaborative rehearsal is when you try to make associations between the information you already know and the information you are trying to learn. All right, let's try to see now how much of this information is going to get into your long-term memory. Answer the questions on the screen right now and check your answers in the comment section down below. And if you need more help with AP Psychology, don't forget to check out my ultimate review packet or the Discord server. Both resources will help you with all the units of AP Psychology, and they'll definitely help you get an A in the class and a five on that national exam. As always, I'm Mr. Sin. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time online.